Ruth Cronenberg, which is executive director from uh, Free Press Unlimited. Roman Zuk. Vitaly Derek. Constantine Kitz. Ixana Haidar. Maxime Medinsky. Natalia Harakos. Alexander Machov. Vira Hirich. Zorosla Zomoyski. Roman Neziborets. Ivan Bal. Dennis Kotenko. Serhi Saikovsky. Yuri Olinik. Lilia Humianova. Ole Yakunin. Victor Dedov. Pavlo Lee. Victor Dudar. Serhi Pushenko. Dilerbek Sharikov. Max Levin. Alexandra Kushinova. Yevin Sakun. These are 24 journalist media workers who lost their lives up till now, either while reporting or whilst fighting the war against Russia. Another five foreign journalists lost their life in action. And sadly, a dozen journalists are being held hostage up to date or have been disappeared. International freedom organizations like Free Press Unlimited are doing everything they can, but of course we could not prevent these killings. But we were able to support over a thousand journalists in Ukraine by supporting them with emergency kits, ballistic vests and helmets, because that is actually what we, Free Press Unlimited, stand for. We work to ensure that reliable information remains available worldwide. It's our mission, therefore, to support journalists in order to maintain the steady flow of free information, reliable information, fact-based information, trustworthy information, globally, but especially nowadays, also in the Ukraine. During a war, it's even more paramount that there is a free flow of independent information available. And one of the key lessons actually that uh, Ukrainian journalists learned during the first invasion of Russia in 2014 is that the lack of the on-ground coverage and gaps in the documentation of war crimes is actually only strengthening disinformation narratives. Since the war, um, a lot of independent media outlets, luckily, have seen a rapid increase in the uh, terms of engagement. Um, especially uh, when it comes to number of views on social media. Also in other countries in the region, like in Moldova and Georgia, we saw that independent media statistics actually were able to push out Russian state propaganda from the top position. Um, as popular news channels, channels, which was previously uh, the case. Still, the Russian authorities and their allies in neighboring countries continue to pressure um, the free and independent media. And anyone, actually, who spreads an opinion that does not coincide with the state, and sadly, since uh, July 6, and that is uh, <coughs> New, uh, the Russian occupied region Kherson actually was blocked from YouTube and Instagram. And this is curious because YouTube actually is still uh, active and operating in Russia itself. So, what does it mean? Is it a kind of um, a further step to create a vacuum information in occupied regions? 
Um, actually, we must uh, acknowledge that that is the case. It means that independent uh, newsrooms actually who used to rely on uh, ad market sales and subscription models f via social media now have to apply for bridge funding to organizations like Free Press Unlimited. But the need and the demand for that bridge funding is far too high that we can come up with. More is actually needed. In the first weeks of Russia's invasion, big tech, ev actually all the big tech companies like Meta, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, Telegram, Twitter, they sprung into action to respond to the pressure from Western governments to regulate the information circulating on the platforms. And actually, they did. They announced that they would intensify efforts to cooperate with the Ukrainian government to mitigate Russia's information warfare. And those efforts include um, especially the creation of the so-called escalation channels by which the platforms prioritize the moderation of content, which is flagged by so-called designated partners. And one of them is the Ukrainian Center for Strategic Communication and Information Center. It's an official Ukrainian agency established on the Ministry of Culture. So since the outbreak of the war, this center has regularly sent to the big tech companies data sets with contents and profiles that violate the terms of service of the platforms. And indeed, in the beginning, the big tech responded. They regulated and they took action. I'm behind with my slides, sorry. <laughs> These are some of the actions that they did. However, especially as time went by, there are very important gaps in the platform moderations and that need to be addressed. So therefore, I want to actually slide in the term proactive moderation. That is, to my opinion, the only way that they can and will be effective. Um, it has become apparent, I think, nowadays, that measures to limit the spread of disinformation they are not enforced by the platforms, especially not when sources of the pro Kremlin narratives are not from official Russian accounts. And we see that actually when they are coming from Russian embassies, especially in the EU. As the war is uh, lingering on, Russian pro, -Kre pro Kremlin propaganda has evolved. And in contrast, the big tech giants have grown less responsive to the emerging developments. The Washington Post uh, actually recently published that many of the requests to the platforms seem to be going unheeded, and especially to Facebook. I quote Mikola Balaban. He's the head of the Ukraine Center that I mentioned before. He mentioned, when it was the first month of full-scale Russian aggression, aggression, the big tech were very proactive and they were very interested to help. Now, they are avoiding even to make a call with us. Equally, given the fact that YouTube still remains one of the few social media platforms, we heard it earlier, currently still operating in Russia, it has become a vital source also of information for the citizens in Russia. But at the same time, we see that more and more channels who are actually publishing anti-Western, pro-Putin, pro-Kremlin uh, videos, they remain undetected and unmoderated. In Ukraine itself, around 26 million people are using Facebook on a monthly basis. 26 million on a total population of 44 million. 
So that means that the media actually inside Ukraine depends heavily on Facebook to get their information out to the public. At the same time, these um, newsrooms and the media are flooded with graphics, with images, with footage from the front line of the war. And of course they want to use it. It's newsworthy, it's vital, it's of the public interest. But the editors, they simply don't know what is allowed to publish on platforms like Facebook or Instagram. And because simply the platforms never made any attempt to identify key controversial topics and provide additional guidance to publishers on how to treat these topics on their platforms. So they don't know whether they are actually doing something that might cause them um, a blockage or that they will be suspended. And this actually happens a lot. Even when there are rules, the rules are confusing and there are inconsistent. And violation of one rule could lead to a strike. Several strikes lead to suspension or a blockage. And uh, it's, it's very typical because this happened to uh, a lot of media, at least 31 we have identified, uh, media near the front line. They actually um, uh, noticed that uh, they have a massive drop in Facebook uh, when it comes to audience. And the, actually, these examples go on and on. It's not unique for Ukraine, sadly. It's uh, done everywhere in the world. The Disinformation Center, which is based in the UK, actually came up with a lot of um, recommendations, which I will not repeat here. You can see it um, on the screen. By the way, this is one of those requests of a media who uh, mentioned to Mita that they were blocked over 40 times and never, never received any answers. These are the recommendations. Just read them yourself. I would say, yes, these recommendations are very, very important and very good, but put them in place everywhere in the world and not only in the Ukrainian situation. Because we, what we witness actually now, we have seen already uh, during the coup and aftermath uh, in Myanmar, but we have also seen it in countries like Nicaragua and Eritrea. So, given all this, sorry, I want to go back to this picture. I would like to take the liberty to rephrase famous words of a U.S. Supreme Court justice named Hugo Black. He said these during the famous case, New York Times versus Su Sullivan. And I want to rephrase this uh, related to the social media platforms. After all, these platforms have taken up the position of a supra-state and that is beyond any regular state we have believed in so far. And it affects us all. It affects policies, it affects politics, economics, society, much more in a very unprecedented way. When Justice Black wrote, in the First Amendment, the Founding Fathers gave the free press the protection it must have to fulfill its essential role in our democracy. The press was to serve the governed and not the governors. And therefore, I think it's high time that the social media platforms take this responsibility serious, seriously and that they start serve the governed and not their interest. We as Free Press and Limited will continue to serve the interests of the governed and doing so by protecting the journalists and independent media. We want to have a responsible online ecosystem with a proactive moderation at the heart of it. After all, if we wouldn't do it, how will we stand in the eyes of history? 
I think it's our duty to fight and to protect those who risk their lives every day to inform the public. And to honor all of those who already have sacrificed themselves to this, to this end. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Uh, there is a question from uh, Pavel, which was uh, among the previous speakers, that he, s he points out that no vest and helmets can save journalists when uh, oppressive leaders East and West target uh, their existence. How shall we save journalism? It is his question. Journalism or journalists? Journalism, he asks. To uh, invest more in independent media itself. I will just, um, my question is related with the following uh, story. I was moderating a panel uh, with war correspondents from Greece covering Ukraine. And one of them said a very interesting thing. He said that there were people that stopped him in the street and asked him what you were reporting. It was true or dictated by your bosses in order to gain support for Ukraine, etc. How can we defend in that way journalism, actually? Yeah, it's of course very difficult, and sadly, the independent media has decreased over time. Um, that goes with the same pace that press freedom worldwide is declining as well. Um, social media also has a very important role to play in that. Um, they use and or misuse uh, independent media. Media had to, the, the whole business, the old business models were gone and media, especially the little ones, the small media, had to reinvent and start all over again uh, making new business models, and a lot of them have failed. So they have to turn to other ways of income, which is, of course, logical. Doesn't mean that uh, independent media is still, and also journalism, um, should not, uh, uh, they actually need our support, especially from the Western world. Okay, so here comes two questions. First one, what is going to be the, the day after media landscape in Ukraine? Secondly, to what extent independent media can survive? Because usually their economics are not to that extent that can sustain their, their viability, actually. Uh, I think it's amazing that in the Ukraine there are still so many uh, media outlets active. It's sad to see, of course, that uh, near the front line uh, media uh, are blocked. Um, over 10,000 journalists are still active in, the, in Ukraine, which is incredible. And they, they refuse to leave the country. They want to stay there and report what is going on. So uh, a lot of uh, initiatives, also the crowdfunding uh, source that you mentioned, uh, including our organizations, but also a lot of other organizations, are there to support the media. So I think especially now during the war, but also after the war, there will be a media landscape in Ukraine. A, a very alive one, actually. The other question is related on what you just have said. To what extent professional journalists can build upon the experience gained from, um, from covering the war, from uh, civil society, let's say, journalism? in what way and how this type of reporting can, can uh, be integrated into a more professional scheme. Yeah, that is something actually that uh, we see now that there is a huge demand from uh, Ukrainian media to, and especially journalists, to have trainings on how to report, especially during wars. They were not trained for that. Uh, they realize it's necessary, but uh, they need proper training for that. And that is where other organizations uh, come in. Of course, there are a lot of, um, especially in Eastern uh, Ukraine, a lot of journalists who have 
uh, sadly, in the last eight years already, a lot of experience uh, by, uh, with uh, war reporting. So um, that is uh, luckily shared with the rest of uh, Ukrainian media. War reporting is also important not only uh, because of its special skill, but also uh, because of document, uh, documenting uh, war crimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, I think that this is a, a, an important element. Um, witnessing journalism uh, in order to document war atrocities. Right. And my final question is, do you think that what have taken place in Ukraine has given the chance journalism to reinvent itself and also prove that it's still worth in uh, 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 worth actually to for media reporting. Absolutely, even you know, I would say even more uh, during conflict and war times, people uh, are so much in need for uh, information. So yeah, absolutely. We actually work in um, over 50 countries. And we uh, also work in so-called media dark uh, areas. You see where there is conflict, where there is, um, there is a lot of me need for independent information. So it's still very, very important, yeah. Thank you. Yes, yes, please. Hi, my name is Alice Stolmeyer from Defend Democracy. I wanted to support uh, Yvonne's point that uh, big tech companies really have a responsibility here. Um, I think they have blood on their hands and they should acknowledge uh, their responsibility and they should be held accountable. And um, would you have a, perhaps an idea how we can, uh, as democracies together, uh, push the big tech platforms to take a more responsible role? Um, yes, actually I do. <laughs> but uh, it's, um, I think, for, first of all, the Ukrainian Center is a very good initiative and I think it should be followed by a lot of other democratic countries. Um, and if they uh, actually join forces, um, Maybe then they can make a fist and uh, uh, that the tech forms or the platforms actually have to respond to. Other, also, I think um, NGOs, journalists, but also human rights defenders organizations, democra de democrat organizations actually also should, un should uh, unite in this, come together and now they are able to um, mention it's that it are incidents and they get away with it. But it's not uh, the case. It's actually systematic. It's done and it's happening everywhere in the world. And we have to find a way to evidence that, to prove that to all of them, uh, that it's actually uh, a systematic thing. And then they are not able to ignore it anymore. But to in order to do so, I, we all need each other in this. We cannot do it on our own. Thank you. Are there any other questions? There is one regarding, uh, regarding uh, again, the big techs and the necessity actually to regulate them. If we can have a short answer, Ruth. Sorry, which one is that? The need to regulate big techs. Yeah. We need. We need. <laughs> well, we asked them to, do, to regulate themselves, and they failed big time. Um, so we have to come up uh, either, uh, I don't think just by governments uh, only or multilaterals. I think it has to be a combined effort from government sides as well as uh, CSOs, NGOs, CSOs. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth for the very interesting presentation. Big applause. Thank you.